Let me recall what we were discussing last time. We started looking at the uh, following situation where the uh, input pump is an ordinary wave <coughs> polarized along the x direction and propagating along the y axis in uh, lithium nitrate. Then we found out the possibility of generating a signal and idler pair which are ordinary, ordinary, or extraordinary, ordinary, ordinary, extraordinary, and extraordinary, extraordinary. Because of quasi-phase matching, I can always ensure that uh, phase matching is possible through a quasi-phase matching phenomenon, and hence, in principle, I should be able to generate any of these pairs. So for lithium nitride, we found that to generate the uh, ordinary, ordinary from an ordinary pump, you need a D11 element, and that is zero in lithium nitride. So this process will not take place. The uh, omega pump, which is ordinary, getting converted to extraordinary ordinary pair, or the ordinary extraordinary pair, can happen because of the D15, which is non-zero. And then to convert the ordinary pump into an extraordinary pair of signal and idler photons requires a D13, which is also zero. So the only possibility is if I launch an omega pump, which is ordinary wave, I can generate an orthogonal pair of signal and idler photons or light, which is, that means I can have either this uh, signal as an extraordinary wave and an idler as an ordinary wave or the signal as an ordinary wave and the idler as an extraordinary wave. Because these two processes are, are different, we need two different phase matching conditions. And uh, I had written down the phase matching conditions corresponding to the two processes. The first one required this condition. The uh, ordinary pump, extraordinary signal, ordinary idler. And you need a capital lambda 1 periodicity for achieving quasi-phase matching. So if I generate a medium with this lambda 1 period calculated from this equation, then or an ordinary pump photon can down convert to a, an extraordinary signal photon and an ordinary idler photon. That is parametric fluorescence, which we have not yet uh, derived or obtained. That will come from quantum mechanical analysis. But at the same time, we, have, we can see that if I launch an ordinary pump photon uh, light and an extraordinary signal light, the extraordinary signal can be amplified by the same process. Similarly, if I launch at lambda i wavelength an ordinary wave and a lambda p wavelength ordinary wave, the lambda i will get amplified and lambda s will get generated in the process. The polarization states of the output are automatically defined by the uh, phase matching condition and the non-zero element of the of the D tensor. It's also possible to generate a pair of uh, ordinary signal photon and an extraordinary idler photon, provided I have another period, capital lambda 2, because it depends now on the ordinary index at lambda s and the extraordinary index at lambda i. This lambda 1 depended on extraordinary index at lambda s and an ordinary index at lambda i. So as an example, let me take lithium now a bit. Again, let, let me go back to lithium now a bit, and uh, let me look at these following wavelengths, lambda, NO, NE. Let me take a 0.6 micron wavelength. The ordinary index is 2.296, and extraordinary index is 2.211. At one micron wavelength, the ordinary index is 2.236, and extraordinary index is 2.160, sorry, 2.160. So if this is the pump and this is signal, what will be the idler wavelength? Can you calculate? What will be the wavelength of the idler? How much? 0.67. Uh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, how much is it? Yes, yes. Please be careful with the calculations. 1.5 micrometer, okay? So that 1.5 micrometers 
the ordinary index is 2.213 and extraordinary index is 2.140. Okay, so I have actually uh, calculated this from the Salomir equation for uh, the ordinary and extraordinary indices of lithium niobate. So these are uh, estimated values. So I can use these equations. I can use this equation to calculate lambda 1 because I know ordinary extraordinary indices at the three wavelengths and the three wavelengths. And similarly, I can also use the second equation to calculate capital lambda 2. And what I will find is lambda 1 comes out to be 5.23 micrometers and lambda 2 comes out to be 6.1 micrometer. Not very close, but uh, they are different. They are different periods. The periods are different because the refractive index at the wavelengths uh, are different and the polarization states are different. So if I make a grating of 5.23 micron and launch an ordinary polarized light at 0.6 micron in the crystal, so omega p I'm launching. So if the incident light at omega p is ordinary polarization, then and if the grating here is the quasi phase match grating here corresponds to a period of 5.23 microns, then I will convert the 0.6 micron to the two wavelengths, one, one micron and 1.5 micron wavelengths. And their polarization states will be automatically determined by the fact that the first one corresponds to a signal which is extraordinary. This one will give me an extraordinary signal and an ordinary idler. This one will give me an ordinary signal and an extraordinary idler pair. So as an amplifier, I can use this, this particular period to amplify an extraordinary polarized signal and in the process generate an ordinary polarization idler. This one I can use, this period I can use to amplify an ordinary wave at 1.0 micron and generate an extraordinary wave at 1.5 microns. So the crystal, the directional propagation, and the polarization state of the pump determine what is possible and what kind of periods I need to achieve this, this interaction process. Now suppose I were to uh, launch light at 1.6 uh, micron and imagine a situation where I have in this speed, in this uh, uh, pole crystal here, I could generate somehow both these periods. Remember, I don't have to have a sinusoidal function. I can, I, I don't have to have one period. I can have, I can have a functional dependence which has more than one period. It need not be periodic. If I have multiple periodicities in a in a function, I can have multiple spatial frequencies. I can have, I can have a, I can have a function of time which has frequencies omega one and omega two simultaneously. Cos omega one t plus cos omega two t. A function of this type has both frequencies. Similarly, I can have a grating, a spatial variation in which both periods are present simultaneously. I'll come to this problem later when I discuss the quantum mechanical aspect. So if I have both gratings simultaneously, what will happen if I launch a pump which is ordinary? So in principle, both wavelengths both will have both the polarization states. Okay, so let me launch light pump light. So the pump photon which comes in could interact with this grating and generate an extraordinary idler and an ordinary signal pair. It could at the same time have interacted with this grating and generated an ordinary signal and an extraordinary idler pair. Both are possible. Classically, I will say that the output consists of either an extraordinary signal and an ordinary idler, 
or an ordinary signal and an extraordinary idler. What I will show you is, when I look at the quantum mechanical picture of this interaction process, this is incomplete. I will show you that the output polarization state of the signal and idler are undefined. They will get defined by the process of your measurement. So there is a complete difference in, in terms of pictures which I can generate from classical and quantum, quantum mechanical analysis. And the photons that will come out, the pairs of photons that come out here have this property of what is called as entanglement, polarization entanglement. And this I'll come to a little later when we discuss the quantum picture. But please note here that I could have structures which has multiple quasi-phase matching periods. I showed you. This is a part of domain engineering. I can have it. I can have a, uh, a, a domain reversal which is whose period is changing with position called chirp grating. I could have all kinds of functional dependence. This functional dependence is my choice. And depending on the choice, I can generate in the functional dependence multiple periods. And those multiple periods will then be responsible for interaction with this uh, in input pump photon to generate pairs of signal and idler, or idler photons. So that's a very interesting uh, uh, picture that will develop when we do the quantum mechanical analysis, because the quantum mechanical analysis is not just re trying to calculate the spontaneous uh, efficiency and so on. The picture is completely different. The predictions from there have no classical counterparts. The properties of the generated photons here, come, which are coming out, will, will, will cannot be explained classically. There are, there are certain properties which have no classical explanation. And that needs a purely quantum mechanical treatment. And that is what we will do after we finish up uh, the classical discussions on nonlinear optics. And one of them is the property of entanglement, where the light coming out from here now, the signal and idler photons which are coming out are said to be entangled in polarization states. That means the state of polarization of the output here are undefined. The only thing I know for sure is that signal and idler photons are orthogonally polarized. Classically, I will say it is either the horizontal vertical pair of signal and idler or the vertical horizontal pair of signal and idler. If signal is like this, idler will be like this. Or if, if idler is like this, signal is like this. This is the only conclusion I get from here. But what I will find out when I do the quantum mechanical analysis is that this is more than this. It has some properties of I cannot even define the polarization state of the output light of the signal or the idler. It's undefined. The Polarization state will get defined the moment I do a measurement of the polarization state. And what I will find is whatever measurement I do on the signal photon influences the result on the measurement of the idler photon, irrespective of the distance separating these two photons. So this I will explain again later. but. This is an interesting feature that will come out from purely quantum mechanical arguments. I cannot show this uh, through a classical arrangement. Yes. So for a given period, let's say capital lambda 1. Yeah. Uh, then also quantum mechanically, both the polarization states are possible. I mean, if we have a grating corresponding to only period lambda 1. Yeah. I will only generate a signal which is extraordinary and an idler which is ordinary. So this is, uh, this is uh, in agreement with quantum mechanical. So, yes. yes. And, but if we have both the periods, then the entanglement property is there. Yes, yes. Because when I have both periods, both, process, both processes are possible. Mm -hmm. And the output is not simply uh, either this or this. Mm -hmm. It is more than that. And that will come out when we do the quantum mechanical analysis. And classically, both kind of polarizations of both the wavelengths are there. If you have yes, yes, yes. That is what I am I am trying to show you. Classical explanation tells me that with this grating, if because when the photon comes in, if it if it interacts with this grating, it will generate 
an extraordinary signal, ordinary idler pair. If it is this grating which affects it, it will generate the other pair. So, the output is much more than this classical interpretation of what is coming out. So, given a crystal, and given, uh, crystal means given the detensor of the crystal, I can find out what are the possible orientations of the pump and signal and idler which can interact through the non-zero elements of the detensor. And knowing that, I can also calculate what are the grating periods required for this interaction to phase match or quasi-phase match and so on. So all this is contained in the uh, energy conservation equation, the momentum conservation equation, and the uh, D tensor of, of the crystal. So what we have done in the class right now is just discuss one example of uh, incident light at omega p being an ordinary wave and uh, with the possibility of generating orthogonal polarization states of the signal and idler. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sir, when we have two gratings and uh, we will be having X, the polarization of both the signal and the idler. Yeah. So there will be like interference of with this group. If we have extraordinary signal and extraordinary idler. So will there be any No, there are two different frequencies anyway. Beats kind of thing. Like yeah. Or well, the beats are at such a high frequency that you cannot normally observe them. Yeah. Unless the frequencies are very close. Your detector will not, your detector will respond to, your detector responds to E1 plus E2 mod square, which is E1 square plus E2 square plus 2 E1 E2 into uh, to cos phi between the two electric fields. But because the frequencies are different, the interference term is, van is varying so fast like beats, exactly like beats, that normally you will not observe. If the frequencies are close by a few kilohertz or a few megahertz, then the detector can respond and tell you that there are beats coming. That's possible, surely possible. Yeah. But these frequencies which are, these wavelengths are very far apart. The frequency difference is so huge that the detectors do not normally pick up these beats. But otherwise, you're perfectly right. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, so what I want to do before we uh, move into an oscillator problem is to discuss uh, the some frequency generation. So what we will do first is uh, to look at the following problem that uh, now I have, I want to look at some frequency. So tell me what I should consider as input. Yeah. Omega s and omega i. Because I want to generate an omega p which is equal to the sum of the input frequencies. I could have called it omega 1, omega 2 and the output is omega 3. It's the same. But I want to use the same set of e equations so I will use the same equation for the frequencies. So omega p is equal to omega s plus omega i. So what pair of equations do I pick up to solve? And what, what approximation should I make? I have three equations, one for omega p, one for omega s, one for omega i. So out of this, for example, remember in difference frequency generation, we had omega p and omega s coming in. And I assumed omega p is a strong light beam, intense light beam, and omega s is weak. So I amplify omega s and I generate omega i. Here I want to do some frequency generation. So one of these beams has to be high power. So let me assume that to be omega s. And omega i is a weak beam. So let me give you a typical example. Remember omega i is smaller than omega s. So lambda i is larger than lambda s. So suppose I have light coming at 1.8 microns wavelength. There are no efficient detectors these for this light. And secondly, the detectors which are available are quite noisy. So what I would like to do is to convert the light signal at 1.8 micron into less than 1 micron, where I can use silicon detectors to de detect light 
and process signal. It's a very efficient method. So I have 1.8 micron. I put a light at a lower frequency, say one micron. The sum of these two, you can calculate, it comes to below one micron. So I can actually convert light at higher wavelengths to light at smaller wavelengths by using the sum frequency generation process. It's very similar to second harmonic. Second harmonic is omega s is equal to omega i. Here, they are different. So now tell me which equation should I take? Omega i and omega p equation and assume E s is almost a constant. So let me write down the equation. So d e p by d z is equal to i kappa p. What are the two terms I'll get here? E s e i exponential minus i delta k z and then d e i by d z is equal to i kappa i e p e s star exponential i delta k z. So I have a, a, a strong signal coming in. Omega s is a strong light wave. Omega i is a weak light wave. And um, it can be weak or strong. It doesn't matter. But omega s assumed to be strong so that I neglect the depletion of the omega s wave. Obviously, I cannot generate omega p unless I deplete omega s. So that's an approximation. So now first let me look at, again, I know that when delta k is equal to 0, I will have maximum efficiency of this process. So let me look at these equations for delta k is equal to 0, that is phase matched case. So I'll get d e p by d z is equal to i kappa p e s e i and d e i by d z is equal to i kappa i e p e s star. So let me differentiate the first equation. So I get d square e p by dz square is equal to i kappa p, e s is assumed to be constant into d e i by dz, which is equal to i kappa p, e s into i kappa i, e s star e p, which is equal to minus kappa i kappa p mod E s square E p. What is the difference between this equation and the equation we had got for difference frequency generation? Sorry? Yeah, it's a negative sign here. So the solution will be oscillatory. So let me call this. Uh, minus of uh, uh, delta square or something, E p. So what is the solution? E p of z is equal to A cos delta z plus B sine. Oscillatory solutions. So how do I find out the constants A and B? I have the initial conditions, e p of z is equal to 0, is equal to 0, because I have only coming in with the signal and the idler. So e p is equal to 0, z is equal to 0, and okay, so e p at z is equal to 0, is equal to 0, implies a is equal to 0. So the solution is E p is equal to B sine delta z. So also let me assume that E i at z is equal to 0 is equal to E i 0. That's the other condition that I'm coming in with the signal and idler. So there's no pump. So I use this equation. And I write DEP by DZ is uh, B delta DEP by DZ at Z is equal to 0 is equal to I kappa P ES EI at Z is equal to 0. 
So this gives me B delta is equal to I kappa P E S E I 0. So let me write this as E I of 0. Let me just keep the same notation E I of 0. So B is equal to I kappa P E S E I of 0 divided by delta. And delta is from here, uh, so this is I kappa P E S E I of 0 divided by delta is square root of kappa I kappa P mod E S square. So this is equal to I times square root of kappa P by kappa I. Let me assume E S is real. Let me assume the phase of the signal to be 0. So E S mod E S square is equal to E S and I get into E I of 0. So the solution I get for E P let me write the two solutions. For E p of z, E p of z becomes i times uh, square root of kappa p by kappa i, e i of 0 sine delta z. And how will e i of z vary? e i of z I get from this equation. So, E i of z will be uh, 1 by i kappa p e s into d e p by d z which is square root of kappa p by kappa i e i of 0 delta cos delta z. E i of z is 1 by i kappa p e s times d e p by d z. So d e by p by dz I substitute from here and all these factors you can show will cancel off and I get e i of 0 cos delta z. They have to cancel because if z is equal to 0, e i of 0 is equal to e i of 0. So these factors you can substitute back for uh, e s and delta and kappa all these factors will just cancel off and I will finally get this. So E i of z So I want to calculate what is the power in the signal in the pump or in the converted frequency N p by 2 c mu 0 mod E p square into area which is equal to N p by 2 c mu 0 kappa p by kappa s kappa i mod e i 0 square sin square delta z which is equal to let me substitute uh, all the quantities let me substitute all the quantities here is equal to n p by 2 c mu 0 kappa p is omega p d by c n p kappa i is omega i d by c n i and I want to replace e i 0 square by the power at the omega i frequency. So how is the power related to this? P i of 0 is equal to n i by 2 c mu 0 mod e i 0 square into area. So this is 2 c mu 0 p i of 0 by n i into area into sin square delta z. This is n p by 2 c mu 0 kappa p by kappa i into E i 0 mod square into sin square delta z. So 2 c mu 0 goes off from here. 
uh, Ni, Ni. There is a, oh, there has to be an S here, area. Please write the S here. There's an area here which cuts off. D, C, NP, omega P by omega I, PI I zero. Why is this factor omega P by omega I coming? It's a photon number problem. The maximum power I can generate at the pump is omega P by omega I times PI of zero. PI of zero by H cross omega I is the, is the number of photons entering per unit time into the crystal at omega I frequency. This implies I have completely converted all those photons. If I convert all the photons at omega i frequency to omega p frequency, how many photons will I generate? Pi of 0 by h cross omega i. Because Pi of 0 is the input power at omega i frequency. Pi of 0 by h cross omega i is the number of photons at omega i entering per unit time at omega i. If I can convert all that into the omega p frequency, the number of photons which will be coming out per unit time at omega p is p i of 0 by h cross omega i. And so the power at the pump omega p will be this multiplied by omega p, which is simply omega p by omega i into p i of 0 sine square delta z. So this now is completely different solution compared to what we got for some frequency. So here what happens is p p of z will go like this. So this is a function of z. This is p p. And pi, will its amplitude be as much as this, or it will be smaller or larger? Smaller, because omega i is smaller than omega p. The number of photons finally are equal. So this idler will have to go like this. When the uh, it starts with full power is idler and no pump, no omega p, the, it converts everything to omega p, and then back to omega i, back to omega p, it's oscillatory. This solution is very different from the solution for different frequency generation. This is some frequency generation, so you can actually convert all the power from the idler to omega i frequency to omega p frequency, provided you have phase matching condition. So if you launch uh, a certain number of idler photons, in principle, if you choose a length, which is, how much is the length I must choose? Delta z must be equal to pi by 2. I must choose a length so that the sine function becomes 1. And if I choose that length of the, of the crystal, then at the end of the crystal, I would convert all the idler photons at omega i frequency to omega p frequency at the output. Of course, if the omega i frequency uh, signal is weak, I will still have a less number of photons coming at a pump, but they are at a different wavelength. Where is the extra energy coming from? Omega s. This here, the number of photons are equal, but you have also taken out exactly the same number of photons from omega s light and converted to omega p. Every time you generate an omega p photon, you have consumed an omega i photon and an omega s photon. You cannot generate omega p from only omega i. You need omega s also. So the omega s is absolutely required. And uh, the, you can actually calculate what is the decrease in power of the omega i at this point. Here, at this point, what will be the content of the crystal? Omega p and omega s. After this. Omega p down converts to omega s and omega i. From here, there was incident on omega p and omega, sorry, omega i and omega s. Omega i got converted to omega p. So at this point, you had omega p and omega s. 
beyond this point, the power flows from omega s to omega p. And sorry, omega p to omega s, and omega p becomes zero, generating omega i and omega s, and this is an oscillatory function of distance. So I was just asking that, uh, we have assumed that E s is not depleting, so E s is constant. In this simul, in this calculation. In this calculation. So the result of the calculation should also reflect this or there is some inconsistency in the equations. Because if you are saying that the energy, we are taking some photons from S to have you know, this excess energy, then we are assuming that there is some depletion. So there is some depletion going on. That is no, that depletion is not apparent in my simulation here. I am assuming PS is constant. So there is an inconsistency because the sum of the, uh, the power conservation is not being maintained in my simulation. Because I cannot have PP, PI, and PS the way I have done. But the interpretation that PS must have decreased is by my logical argument, that's all. This analysis, I have assumed PS is constant, and that's not correct. So this is the approximate equation which I've got, assuming the omega, is, omega PS is constant, but I know that when I solve all the equations exactly, I will be able to convert from omega I to omega P and I would have also take, taken up some energy from omega s in this process. Because I know this process interpretation as a merging of photons at omega s and omega i to generate omega p. So every time I lose a pump a photon at omega i, I should have lost a photon at omega s also simultaneously. So that's an important uh, thing. But uh, uh, so this equation right now is inconsistent because uh, I've only assumed pp is a function of z and pi is a function of z and ps is independent of z. This is not correct. They will not satisfy this set of equations. They'll approximately satisfy this set of equations. So if I take not this correct. equation then do an energy balance? You will not be. Because you will see that pp of z plus pi of z plus ps of z is not a constant. Because ps is constant and you will not find pp plus pi is not constant. You see pi is uh, pi zero sine squared cos squared delta z and this plus this is not constant. I need the other one to make it uh, cons consistent. Okay, so some frequency uh, has applications in converting light from a uh, longer wavelength to shorter wavelengths. And uh, essentially you can achieve this by using uh, nonlinear effects, which means effectively you can convert light at uh, infinite wavelengths to into the visible region of the spectrum. The efficiencies, et cetera, depend, of course, on uh, the, uh, the, the nonlinear coefficient which is contained here and the kind of lengths required. I mean, delta depends on the nonlinearity. You see here, delta depends on kappa i, kappa i, kappa p. And uh, kappa i and kappa p both are functions of nonlinearity. So delta square is kappa i, kappa p mod e s square. So it depends on the signal power and also the nonlinearity which is contained in the d coefficients inside the kappas. So, uh, how much of the length required to do this, et cetera, is a function of the crystal. Of course, in all this analysis, we have assumed that there is no other loss mechanism of these light waves. We are assuming the crystals are completely transparent. So in principle, I need to take that into account if the length becomes longer and longer. I, need to, I can't neglect the fact that light could be lost by scattering processes or absorption by other mechanisms and so on. Okay, so that finishes some frequency. Uh, uh, generation from uh, to input uh, low frequency signals to generate a higher frequency signal at the output. And as I was mentioning, a second harmonic generation is one special case of the sum frequency where two frequencies are equal. Omega s is equal to omega i, and I, can, I generate a two omega light at the output. Okay, now I want to discuss uh, optical parametric oscillators. also called OPO. So I've shown that uh, if you launch light at omega p and omega s and satisfy the phase matching condition, you can amplify omega s light. <coughs> the power at omega s frequency goes up as cos hyperbolic square gamma gamma z or something okay so that is an optical amplifier 
this amplification is very similar to what you can amplify light by using population inversion. In lasers, you have population inversion, which means you put more atoms in the excited state compared to the ground state. And then uh, because of uh, more simulated emissions, the input light gets amplified and you make an optical amplifier. So this is another kind of amplifier. The, the great advantage here is this amplifier does not depend on the existence of certain energy levels at certain frequencies. Because as long as the crystal has nonlinearity and it is transparent, I can generate any pairs of omega s, omega i, omega p. I can have any combination as long as I can satisfy the phase matching condition. And d tensor is finite. There is a d tensor element which gives you a coupling. So these are optical amplifiers and I can convert an amplifier to an oscillator. That means a source of radiation. An oscillator is a source. An amplifier is only amplifying. For an amplifier, you input the signal, it gets amplified as it comes out. A source, you just give it energy and it generates radiation at a certain frequency. So I can convert, just like in a laser, I can convert a, an amplifier into an oscillator by putting this amplifier within a pair of mirrors. So let me take a pair of mirrors. Let me assume that I have, this is omega p coming in. Now usually I will choose the reflectivity of this mirror at the pump frequency to be zero. I can make mirrors having reflectivity at certain wavelengths and trans completely transmitting at other wavelengths. This is possible by using, uh, what do I do? Thin film dielectric coatings. I can have a coating and by interference effects, I can have very strong reflectivity at certain wavelengths and very weak reflectivity at other wavelengths. So theoretically, I'm assuming that these two mirrors have zero reflectivity. The pump just goes through. So now let me assume that I have, uh, by mechanism, either by birefringence phase matching or by quasi phase matching, I have, I'm satisfying the phase matching condition for one pair of frequencies, omega s and omega i. Kp is equal to Ks plus Ki or Kp is equal to Ks plus Ki plus, this is, this is birefringence phase matching, this is quasi phase matching. By some uh, arrangement, I can achieve phase matching. So now, I launch a pump light into the crystal. Okay, can you can you tell me an electronic oscillator? How does it start? I have an electronic oscillator, which means it's so a function generator, a gen a, a, an instrument which generates. A, electric uh, waves at a certain frequency. How do, how do they generate? How do they start? And what frequency will they emit? Because I'm just feeding power into the system. They, emit the they will emit a resonant frequency. But why does it generate at all? Why does it start to generate? How does it start to, from where does it start to generate? It's only an amplifier, remember. I have a circuit in which I keep on feeding energy and that circuit has a resonant mode which is uh, as the... No, but your free, free energy is being fed at a different frequency. Yes. So, how does it generate a new frequency? I have to phase match. I have to, uh, to use a MOSFET in an electronic circuit where uh, as and when the noise... Uh, depending on noise, the noise, noise, noise. If there was no noise, there is no oscillation. There must be some noise. In a laser, what is the noise? Spontaneous emission. The moment you take atoms in the excited state, they will start to jump down and without any stimulation. And that light which generates generated by the spontaneous emission process is the noise that starts the laser. If the spontaneous emission did not take place, there is no laser. So spontaneous emission like noise is absolutely required for the start of the oscillator. What is the noise here? The modes are only uh, frequencies which can exist in a system. 
It doesn't mean they will exist. What noise? From where do I get omega s cross first? So, from quantum mechanics, you said that all the wave, all the frequencies are present at all times. Hmm? So here, what is the process which will start this laser? Like stimulate spontaneous emission. So we have omega p incident. P, yes. And omega s uh, will be there by the surrounding noise that is exists at we said at all. Quantum non uh, fluctuating noise. Yes, yes. Which res which results in what first? Generation of omega s and omega s. From what process? Spontaneous parametric fluorescence or down conversion. Omega p photon comes in, it interacts with the crystal and spontaneously down converts to a pair of omega s omega i photons. That down conversion is brought about by the vacuum fluctuation. Just like spontaneous emission is brought about by the vacuum fluctuation. So this omega p photon comes in or light comes in and spontaneously they split into omega s omega i photons, some of them. Now, I can have, for example, this is the reflectivity of the signal wavelength is close to 1, and reflectivity at the signal wavelength is also close to 1, for example. I make the mirrors which are transmitting at pump, but very high reflectivity at signal wavelength. So what's going to happen is, and let me assume that Ri is also 0 and Ri is also 0. The reflectivity at the idler wavelengths are zero. So the spontaneously generated signal photons, which direction will they be generated? In the forward direction. So when they come here, part of them will get reflected back. Some of them will transmit. Suppose 99%, 1% gets reflected back. And as it propagates through the crystal, does it get amplified? No, because Why? It will not be phase matched. matched. Kp is like this, and Ks like this. Not you will not satisfy the phase matching. This is not. The, this is, will require a negative Ks here. This will not satisfy either of these conditions. So the signal light comes back without amplification. In a laser, it gets in a normal population inversion laser. It gets amplified in the reverse direction also. It uses the same population inversion to get amplified in the reverse direction. It comes here. Then, again, partly transmitted, partly reflected, and once it starts again, now it uses the pump and gets amplified. Because I have shown you that the signal, at this point now, there is a signal and pump, and signal will now draw energy from the pump and get amplified as it propagates. And this will go back and forth and will increase the level of the signal inside. And of course, the level of the idler will have to, idler is not increasing inside, they're escaping from the cavity because you're not holding it on inside the cavity. This is, called, this is a fabri pero cavity. You've studied fabri pero in, in a course. This is the fabri pero cavity. So the signal light is trapped inside the cavity with a little bit of escaping from both sides. And as the signal increases in intensity, what should happen? It cannot, it cannot go on increasing infinitely. And the losses will be equal to the uh, amplification. No, but amplification is is always there. But yes. There is also loss. Gain saturation. Gain saturation. Any amplifier has to have a gain saturation. Because start you start with a loop gain more than one. So the amount of loss is less than gain. So it increases in, in amplitude. If you have all the time gain more than loss, this will keep on increasing to infinity. But what's going to happen is as the signal becomes larger and larger, it will bring down the gain. And it will bring down the gain to a value such that gain is equal to loss. That's gain saturation. So what's going to happen is as the signal power increases, the pump power will start to drop. Our assumption that the pump is non-depleted will fail at that point. I can't, I can't keep assuming pump is undepleted when the signal becomes so strong and so much of energy being drawn out from the pump. So the pump power will drop down. And once the pump power drops, the gain will drop because the gain depends on the pump power. And I will reach a gain saturation where the signal will, uh, will be such that the round trip gain is equal to round trip loss. And 
the light will come out at both omega s and omega i. Omega i, is, omega i is a very strong wave because it's a fraction of what is contained inside, but there's a lot of power at omega i also coming out of the cavity. Yeah. Uh, what would contribute to the loss? The loss is the finite reflectivity. Okay. Suppose 99%, 99%. Every time I go through one round trip, I lose 2% of that light. So I must gain the 2%. So the pump power will adjust itself to give me a gain of 2% for every loss of 2% in one round trip. So it will saturate when the loss is equal to the gain. For, a, for any oscillator. That's the place where the oscillation will become steady and you will get, get a continuous uh, signal coming out. So, but the amount, the intensity, the power of the signal that comes out is only like one or two percent of the omega p power. Uh, maximum, if we say that all the power no, no. omega p is converted to omega s, let's say. I mean, it's only a fraction of what is contained inside the cavity at omega s. Omega p is still coming out. I'm not converting all omega p to omega s. If, if this is 99% and 99%, I'm, what I'm getting is 1% of one either side of what is contained inside the cavity. So what, whatever is contained inside of the cavity, so it has to be uh, of the order of power of omega, omega p. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at the output, we are getting very less power of omega s because it's only 1% of the maximum that is achieved inside the cavity. Yes, yes. So, but uh, that could be in watts. I can put 10 watts of power at omega p and I can get a watt of power at omega s. Point. We'll put some numbers and calculate when we uh, actually calculate these, uh, the, 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 the oscillation condition. So what we need to do is we need to have an oscillation condition. What is the pump power required for the laser for the oscillator to start? And what will be the frequency? The frequency is given by this. Is there any other condition on omega s? It has to be a resonant mode inside the cavity. So what is the frequency which will be resonant inside this cavity? Multiple of? Yes. So uh, if the length, if I call the length as L, L is equal to n lambda s by 2. M, let me put it m. <coughs> and this is m by 2. Please remember this is, uh, I must write refractive index because this is usually the wavelengths which I'm using are free space wavelengths. So the wavelength inside the cavity is lambda s by n s. So the wavelength which will come out, which will oscillate is uh, in terms, in, in fact, I can write in terms of frequency. So this is C by nu s. So this implies nu s is equal to the frequency has to satisfy this condition as well as this condition of omega p is equal to omega s plus omega i and this condition of kp is equal to ks plus ki. So this omega s will actually adjust itself to satisfy these conditions and what will come out is uh, supposed to be light at this frequency omega s and of course omega i uh, light is also coming out of the cavity. This is a, what is called as a singly resonant oscillator, SRO, which means only the signal is resonating inside the cavity. The idler is not resonating because the mirrors have zero reflectivity at the idler. I can also have a situation where Ri is also close to 1. Then it's called a doubly resonant oscillator because then the signal and idler will both resonate inside the cavity. I can also have a situation where pump also resonates inside the cavity and I will have a triply resonant oscillator. We will discuss the doubly resonant and the singly resonant oscillator in the class. And I'll show you that the powers required for operation of the doubly resonant are much lower than required for the singly resonant oscillator, but at some price. And the price is in terms of instability of the laser system itself. Okay, so we'll stop here now. So what we'll do is uh, uh, discuss 
and calculate what is the threshold pump power required for the laser for the oscillator to start for the singly resonant case for the doubly resonant case and how does it depend on the reflectivity of the mirrors the length of the cavity etc cetera, etc cetera. okay do you have any questions sir yeah uh, omega ac is trapped in the cavity so how will it come no not fully trapped close to one i'm writing 99% maybe reflectivity like a like a laser the laser has mirrors if you have mirrors of 100% reflectivity nothing comes out it's oscillating but nothing comes out but i want something output so i need to have at least one of the mirrors to be having a reflectivity less than one and that will be transmitting that fraction so this mirror has a finite reflectivity at the resonant frequency at the omega s frequency and so a little light well, at omega s will be coming out and that is quite strong already okay the mirrors are not perfectly reflecting at all wavelengths then you can't see what is inside nothing comes out from inside so it's completely opaque for you yeah sir in general uh, in the lasers when we do second harmonic generation yeah uh, so in that also do we have oscillators I mean, such that uh, the power coming out at the second harmonic i mean or no 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 you can have a laser and a second harmonic generator outside or you can put the second harmonic generator crystal inside the cavity yeah inside intra cavity second harmonic generator yeah. okay let like in pulse lasers yeah. usually when they are used for the laser ablation processes hmm. there is a second harmonic which is coming out so inside there is some oscillator of this kind there is a crystal so a crystal uh, so the mirrors are 100% reflecting at the omega frequency hmm. and partially transmitting at two omega frequency yeah so we have such a system inside yeah yeah so okay. not such a system just a crystal it's exactly the same as a laser yeah but with the population inversion right? okay. for any laser there are mirrors there are mirrors there is a laser okay. cavity and there is a crystal inside that crystal actually helps to convert the oscillating omega to two omega and what comes out is two omega and not omega okay anything else thank you